audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. Dr. Michael Yusuf wants to share his excitement for heaven with you on this episode of Leading the Way. Whenever I dwell on my mortality, <laughs> I rejoice and I think of the beauty of heaven. As a matter of fact, that's what I'm going to talk about today the beauty of heaven, my eternal home. So fasten your seat belt as we go on this amazing journey to look at these eight facets of the beauty of heaven. Well, you heard Dr. Yusuf. Fasten your seatbelts because he's ready to give you a glimpse of heaven's beauty through the pages of the Bible. Thanks for joining Dr. Michael Yusuf for Leading the Way. Today, the continuation of his exciting series, Heaven Awaits, teaching that grew out of a passionate life of studying what God's Word says about the promise of our eternal home. Listen along with me now as Dr. Yusuf begins today's message. Let's look at number one. First of all, The Bible said we're going to have an uninterrupted fellowship with Jesus. Uninterrupted. Hear me right, please. Every other facet in heaven pales in approximation to this one. We will be in His presence continuously. We will be experiencing an unending and unbroken fellowship throughout all of eternity. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12, Paul tells us, Now we see only reflection as in a mirror, but then we shall see Him face to face. Now I know in part, oh, but then I shall know Him fully as I am fully known. Remember, in Paul's days, mirrors are not like ours with their clarity and show you every little wart in your face. (laughs) They were not that kind of mirrors. They were just polished iron, polished metal, almost like formica, if you've seen a formica. It just barely provided a reflection, but not with clarity. And that's why the King James Version actually says that we see through glass darkly, because that's all they could see. But we shall see Jesus face to face. We shall see reality as it reality is, not as we think it is or we hope it is, there will be no barriers. There will be no limitation to our understanding and to our comprehension. We will also experience uninterrupted fellowship with our loved ones who have gone ahead of us, who have gone before us. Now, later in this series, I'm going to show you what the Bible says about the new heaven and the new earth. But for now, for now, I want to talk about the present heaven, the present heaven. And I'm going to show you the difference. The present heaven, or paradise, where the believers go the moment they close their eyes in death. When we say that our loved ones who knew and loved Jesus have gone into heaven, we are referring to paradise, or the present heaven. Yeah, the book of Revelation revealed to us. That's why it's called Revelation, because it reveals to us. It reveals to us the present heaven, the beauty of the present heaven, the awe-inspiring place that's called heaven. And that is why Jesus, Paul, and John all called it paradise. This is the heaven of which Ezekiel, in Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 1, says, the heavens were open." and I saw a vision of God. This is the heaven of which Stephen, the very first Christian martyr, when he's being stoned to death just before he died, just before the last stone took him, and he looked up to heaven, and in the book of Acts chapter 7, verse 56, he said, I see heaven open, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of the Father. He stood up, to receive him into heaven. And I believe he will do that for every faithful believer. This is the heaven of which the Apostle Paul had the privilege of seeing. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4, he said, I heard inexplicable. Can you say that word with me? Inexplicable things that no one is permitted to tell. 
until the new heaven appears. The present heaven is a place of reunion. It's a place of communion. It's a place of rejoicing, and I can't wait to get there. God, in His sovereign will, in His sovereign will, He allowed John and Paul to see it in order to testify to it. But also God brought down Moses and Elijah in their glorified body to the Mount of Transfiguration. You remember? Three disciples with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Moses and Elijah in their transformed body, in their glorified body, appear on that Mount of Transfiguration. Saul was not asleep. (laughs) Jesus brought them in deliberately. Why? In order to show the disciples and to show us that we too are going to be in a glorified body in heaven just like them. Amen. Give God glory. And so, the first facet of heaven, uninterrupted fellowship. The second facet of heaven is that we're going to rest from our spiritual battles. Revelation 14, 13, John writes, When I heard a voice from heaven say, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord, From now on, yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor, and their work will follow them. Now, beloved, please listen to me. We are not going to be idols in heaven. I'm going to show you in a minute. That's not what the text is saying, that we're going to be sitting idle. No, 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 no. We're not going to be hanging out in heaven. (laughs) But we're going to rest from Satan's continuous oppression and opposition. We will rest from his spiritual attack. We will rest from all of satanic activities that seem to be on the increase today. We will rest from the opposition that we face as Christians, especially today. We will rest from a constant wrestling with temptation. That's the kind of rest we're talking about. (laughs) You know, in the Old Testament, God did not establish the Sabbath for golf. God did not establish the Sabbath for the beach. The Bible said God created the world in six days, and He rested on the seventh day. Was He exhausted? (laughs) Was He, I'm tired now, I'm going to rest. No! No! He's talking about the rest of satisfaction, the rest of contentment. That's the kind of rest he's talking about. And the Sabbath is a day in which we take our minds off of everyday's plans, off our business activities, so that we may focus on God, so that we may focus on His majesty, on His dominion, and His power, on His mercy, and on His grace, and His love for us. That's what the Sabbath rest is all about. In heaven, we will have an eternal Sabbath, an eternal rest, eternal contentment, an eternal peace, where we'll be spending all of our time free from all the earthly struggles, from worries, from anxieties, and from all sorts of temptations. The third facet of heaven is serving Jesus in heaven. Serving Jesus in heaven. (laughs) <laughs> Revelation 22, verse 3 tells us the throne of God and the Lamb will be in that city. And get this, get this, don't miss this, and His servant will serve Him. We're not going to be idle. In heaven, we will be honored and privileged to serve Jesus full time, all the time. In our transformed resurrected bodies, we'll be spending mental energy and mental capacity comprehending the incomprehensible love of God. And listen, that serving is not going to be begrudging. No. It's going to be joyful. It's going to be enthusiastically. And it's not going to be feel like it's a chore or a burden. No. We're not going to get fatigued or tired or exhausted in the service of God. No. Instead, we will serve God 
gladly and joyfully with deep, deep, deep gratitude for redeeming us. We will be so grateful because we will see things as they ought to be seen. We will experience an ultimate fulfillment which eludes us here on this earth. What kind of service will it be? You know, the Bible gives us just a hint. Just a hint. doesn't give us a lot of the info, but just a little hint what our service for Jesus in heaven will be like. You want to know it? We're going to reign and rule with Him. We're going to reign and rule with Him. In 2 Timothy 2.12, it says that if we endure, say that with me, if we will also reign with Him. Revelation 20 verse 6 tells us that we will be priests of God and of Christ, and we will reign with Him. Jesus, in His parable of the servants, He tells us that those who serve faithfully in this life will hear from the lips of Jesus, well done, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful on few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. The fourth facet of heaven is full knowledge. Full knowledge. (laughs) Oh, in this life, I know we are all full of questions. I know. We're all full of questions. Why do the righteous suffer? Why does the innocent suffer? Why the wicked appears to be prospering? Why children sometimes experience incurable diseases? Why do earthquakes and floods and hurricanes devastate lands and kill people? On and on and on and on. We're full of questions. Here on earth, we have questions. But listen to me. In heaven, we will have full knowledge and complete understanding of all mysteries. Can I get an amen? Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12. Now we know in part. Then I shall fully know as I am fully known. Why? Because we will see all things through God's eyes. We see things from God's perspective. We will have no need for questions. We won't have any questions when we get there because we will understand justice from God's point of view. We will understand free will and God's sovereign election from God's point of view. We will be able to think of God's thoughts after Him, because we will finally have God's view of reality. Now we don't. When we get to heaven, or hell for that matter, no one would say, oh, God, you are unfair. God, you're not just. You know the story Jesus tells, and it's not a parable, it's a real story about Lazarus and the rich man? And you see how the man who was so self-centered, lived for self, ended up in Hades, and Lazarus was carried by the angels to paradise, to the bosom of Abraham. You remember that story? That man who ended up in hell, not one time this said, God, it's unfair, why am I here? No, no. He knew exactly why he's there. And he accepted that reality. The only thing he asked for is for Lazarus to rise from the dead so that his five brothers who don't know God will come to know him. As I often say, a few minutes in hell, and he became a great evangelist. (laughs) Because we will have full knowledge. The fifth facet of heaven is righteousness and beauty reign. In heaven, we will live holy, unrighteous lives. We're going to live pure lives. God is going to replace our sinful, fallen minds and hearts with pure ones. Sometimes I imagine if somebody who'd never been born again, somebody who never surrendered their life to Christ, nobody has anything to do with Jesus in this life, rejecting Him even, or ignoring Him, or whatever it is. Just imagine that person shows up in heaven. Think about it. He would be miserable in heaven. She would be miserable in heaven. Think about it with me, please. The unregenerated mind and heart, the rebellious and the deliberately sinful person, 
They couldn't stand the purity and the righteousness in heaven. And that is why Revelation 21, 27 says, nothing impure will enter it. Nothing impure will enter it. Nor will anyone who does what is shameful and deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the book of life. Question, how do you know that your name is written in the book of life? How do you know that? Well, the first step, that I'm a sinner, and I'm sinned against God. I cannot save myself. I need the Savior, and I go in humility and in brokenness, ask for the one who took my sin upon that cross to redeem me, to save me eternally. That's the first step. That's only the first step. But you have to live the rest of your life loving Jesus and hating sin, because the first step does not stop there. It cannot stop there. It must not stop there but you spend the rest of your earthly life rejecting, not normalizing sin. That's how you know your name is written in the book of life. One of the great indications of salvation is not sinlessness. That's never going to happen in this life. To get that out of your system. It's not sinlessness. Only Jesus was sinless. That's why the Bible said, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we do what? confess. And so you have to live the rest of your life hating sin. Deep down, not only just hating sin in my life, but also deep down, you're longing for purity. You're longing for righteousness. Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger for righteousness. Those when they sin, they cannot wait to confess and repent. Deep down, we long and love holiness and separation from sin. The sixth facet of heaven is abundance. Abundance. Revelation 22, 1 and 2 describes the river of water as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood a tree of life, bearing twelve fruits, yielding fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Now, let me give you an interpretation, explanation of this metaphor. This is a metaphor, metaphoric language. I want to explain it to you. In that city, there are no cemeteries because there is no death. In that city, it's a city without hospitals because there will be no illnesses or diseases there. In the city, there has no mental institutions, because there is no depression, no sadness, no sorrow, no stress, no anger there. The first two chapters of Genesis and the last two chapters of Revelation, they mirror each other. They mirror each other. The latter city will replace the Garden of Eden. In other words, God would restore His creation to even better and more abundant state than the original Eden. Listen to me. Genesis 1 and 2 shows us God's act of creation. In Revelation 21 and 22 shows us God's act of recreation. The seventh facet of heaven, continuous glory. Glory is the revelation, full revelation of God's character. And that is why Jesus, in His high priestly prayer, in John chapter 17, in that high priestly prayer, He said, Father, glorify Your Son, that Your Son may glorify You. God the Son asking God the Father to shine through God the Son from the cross. Uh, In heaven, we will see the full revelation, the full revelation of God's character. Uh, We can't fully comprehend it. Now, it would be impossible. Actually, sometimes I try to imagine if God ever reveals His true glory, I'm telling you, we'd be incinerated. His purity will incinerate us in this body of sin. But there, in heaven, we will experience the glory of God ourselves. We will have the characters of God. 
the presence of God, we're going to experience that in a way we could never, 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 never see it or experience it in this world. Colossians 3, 4, when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will appear with Him in glory. In other words, the full revelation of the character of God is going to be our character. That bugs my mind. Everything that God is, everything that God has, He will share with us, including His character. Eight, continuous worship. Continuous worship. I need to stop and explain this because through the years, people have really misunderstood and messed this thing up because they thought it's going to be like one of those boring church services, 11 o'clock service continuously. <laughs> you see, worship is more than just singing. Worship comes from the word worth or the word honor. And that is why worship is a way of life, magnifying, worldly, lifting up, the, showing what God is worth to us. It is all-consuming expression of the worthiness of Jesus. And that is why Revelation 19 gives us but a tiny, tiny, tiny glimpse of how from every tribe, from every nation, from every tongue, they will be standing before the throne of God, praising Him, thanking Him for redeeming us. Thanks for joining listeners around the world for hope-filled words from Dr. Michael Yusuf about heaven, your eternal home. If you'd like to spend time talking with the Leading the Way pastor or counsellor about life, death, heaven, and your salvation, consider connecting with Leading the Way today. Start your conversation by going to ltw.org slash Jesus. As we close out today's Leading the Way audio, I'd like to share recent letters viewers of the Kingdom Sat shared with us. Basina, an Iraqi in the USA, said, Dr. Michael Youssef, your ministry is truly anointed by the Holy Spirit. May the Spirit prevail freely to convict hearts and make people repent of their sins and accept the absolute truth in Jesus Christ. Elias in Germany writes, May the Lord bless the Kingdom Sat TV channel. You're truly serving both the believers and the lost by helping them find Jesus the Savior. Andre in Sweden. Lord, we thank you for the Kingdom Sat channel and its faithful servant, Dr. Michael Yusuf. Victoria, Sudan. Dr. Michael Yusuf, all the words you shared were extremely beneficial. May the Lord protect you always to be a blessing. Learn more about leading the way and the Kingdom Sat when you call 1 300 133 589. Once again, 1 300 133 589 or online at ltw.org. Ltw.org. Or you can write to Dr. Yusuf at Leading the Way, P.O. Box 1900, Penrith, New South Wales 2751. Leading the Way, P.O. Box 1900, Penrith, New South Wales. 2751. This program is furnished by Leading the Way with Dr. Michael Youssef. Connect with Leading the Way through audio, video, YouTube, Facebook, X, and other social media networks you engage with. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.